Uh, our next speakers are from the Avian um, Genetics Laboratory of the National University of Singapore. Professor Frank Wright and Ms. Karen Sarinandan research on the short-tailed tabla, Palonia malacansi. Using this bird to examine levels of genetic diversity in contrast to comparable populations across its zodiac range, as well as look for signs of inbreeding and population bottlenecks. So let's welcome first Professor Brian to give his presentation on population genetics of the short tail tabla. Um, I apologize for the confusion with the um, title, but uh, I promise it will all make sense within about five minutes. Um, my name is Frank Wright. I'm from the National University of Singapore. Uh, this is one of my students, Karen Sadananda, and we would like to talk about some of the research that's carried out in my lab. Um, in particular, we hope that by the end of this talk, we will have convinced uh, you of the importance of uh, population genetic research um, in biodiversity conservation, including um, the conservation of these fragmented habitats here in Singapore. So let's talk about this topic um, from the angle of birds, because uh, most of the research in my lab is carried out on birds. Um, here you see pictures of a number of bird species that used to live with us here in Singapore, that used to live on this island uh, about 100 to 120 years ago, but they've all gone extinct in the meantime. Um, there is a large degree of um, uh, avian extinction in Singapore. Um, if we look at the total of 185 resident birds that used to be on the island in 1819, uh, about a quarter of them have gone extinct. Now this number goes up if uh, we look at uh, birds that are only restricted to forest habitat. Um, it goes up to about 40%. Uh, that's quite a number. And that, um, the challenge in the future, of course, is to prevent more um, extinction from happening uh, in Singapore. And we haven't been very good at this. Um, bird species keep slipping into extinction even now in the present decade and uh, after the millennium, the new millennium. So it's not hard to understand why most of the birds that have gone extinct in Singapore are forest dependent. If we look at this map of Singapore from the olden days, uh, before human settlement took over, uh, most of the uh, land area of Singapore was really covered by lowland dipterocarp forest and some other forest types back then, almost 100% of the land area of Singapore. Um, back in 1815, there were about 1,000 uh, people on the island. That's the size of a small kampong. Um, then, by the late 1800s, the uh, British colonization had taken over. There was a, a huge immigration from China for the tin mines. We had, um, sorry, we had on the order of uh, 80,000 people, and now we all know there's five and a half million people on the island. And this has come with drastic changes to the environment in Singapore. This is a map of Singapore as we see it now, um, and you see that uh, there's only tiny fragments of natural habitat remaining on the island. Uh, most of these are concentrated in the central catchment area. Now, let me talk a little bit about this concept of population genetic diversity and why that is so important for the conservation of animals and plants here in Singapore. Um, think of a healthy population that has a lot of individuals, like this uh, bowl here with many little balls inside, and they all have different colors, and these different colors stand for different genotypes. And it's important to have many different colors, many different genotypes in a population. Um, if you take away the habitat from uh, these animals or plants, you reduce the population in number, but not only do you reduce the absolute number of individuals in the population, but you also reduce the colors that are represented in your population. In this highly uh, reduced population here that you end up with, uh, not only do you have a very small amount of the uh, number of individuals from the beginning, but also you only have three colors represented here. And the bad thing is that one of these colors is very dominant. That means most of the individuals in your population will have a very similar genotype. That is not good. That can be lethal for populations. For things such as diseases sweeping through a population, you want to have a lot of different genotypes to ensure that at least some of your individuals are going to be resistant against the disease for things like uh, climatic events, and we're going to see more and more of those. We've seen the, the great drought at the beginning of this year with climate change hitting the planet. We're going to see more and more of that in the future. You want to have a few individuals that are going to be better adapted to these weird climatic events that are going to be popping up here and there. Um, and with a um, population that's got a greatly reduced uh, 
population genetic diversity, such as this one, there is also a high danger of inbreeding. Think of it, if you have a population of 20 individuals around you, most of those 20 individuals will be your siblings or your cousins. And we all know what happens when there's inbreeding. Most of the offspring will be born uh, dead or infertile um, or in inviable. So um, populations with a low population genetic diversity are bound to go extinct over time. And that's what we have observed in birds a lot. Let's take a look at this hypothetical map of a bird species. Let's call it the short-tailed babbler. And you will hear more about this species from Karen in her research. Um, she will talk about it in just a minute. Um, this is a map from the old Singapore when the forest was still around. So let's assume there were many different pairs of short-tailed babblers breeding all over the island. This is a, a very reasonable assumption. Now, if you fast forward, and um, this is actually um, a wrong number here. I should have put 2010 or something like that. You see that there's only a few pairs remaining um, on the whole island. Most of those are concentrated in the central catchment. Um, I don't personally know whether there's still a few around in this area. This is a military area that we don't get access to. Uh, perhaps some of the people in the art, well, I just see that from one very knowledgeable young gentleman here that this population has gone extinct. Um, and there's no, uh, there's no wonder that this population has gone extinct because um, the last time this population was around, it wouldn't have had any contact with that population over here. These birds, these short-tailed babblers, are very um, undispersed. They don't like dispersal very much. They need connected habitat in order to have gene flow between the different patches. You would basically have a little population sitting here that's getting more and more inbred and poorer and poorer over time in, in terms of the population genetic diversity and finally going extinct. That's actually what happened right here in the Botanic Garden just a few years ago. In this little forest patch in the Botanic Garden, we had short-tailed babblers breeding. There was a tiny little breeding population that went extinct three years ago because these birds had no more uh, connectivity with the central catchment. Um, they probably became so inbred, the three, four, five pairs that would have been circling around that little forest patch, that they would have gone extinct over time. Now the sad thing is that the same thing seems to be happening within the central catchment. It's not that the central catchment is this huge block of homogenous habitat. Uh, it's far from that. It's uh, divided into all these little patches. Here's the Bukitima area that's adjacent, but divided by road. Uh, here's the southern and northern area divided by golf courses and reservoirs. Um, so you have a lot of fragmentation even within the central catchment for birds like the short-tailed babbler that need habitat connectivity, that need corridors. And Karen will be talking more about this particular population that seems to be on its way out right now. Uh, it's just a matter of time, if you ask me. Um, the Sing Singaporean bird list is still graced by many species. Um, and uh, some of these species are artifacts. They make us more confident of the state of the environment here. Um, but in fact, many of these species are functionally extinct. You have uh, photos of four different species here. Some of them are really common in uh, Malaysia, uh, anywhere where there's some kampung habitat, like some natural habitat outside of the cities, you see these buff vented bubbles. In Singapore, they have become functionally extinct, yet they are still on our bird list, uh, because once in a while you get these stragglers, these uh, prospecting individuals that make it to Singapore, they get seen by our bird watchers, but there isn't really any breeding going on here. Um, here you have um, a bunch of species that are on their way out. Um, chestnut wing babbler, white-chested babbler, two very rare babbler species that are um, approaching uh, dangerously low uh, population levels right now where uh, the population genetic diversity must be at the lower end of viability. This is the red-eyed bulbul, another example of a very common species in Malaysia that's um, only around with a few breeding pairs in Singapore these days. And uh, here, last but not least, the uh, short-tailed babbler. And I'm going to hand over the microphone to Karen and hope that uh, she will present to you some of the very interesting results um, of her population genetic research for her honors thesis, by the way. It's listed as near threatened by the IUCN due to habitat destruction across its range. So this is a map of Southeast Asia. 
and the shaded portion is where the shark tail babbler currently resides. Um, as you can see, it occurs on sorry, it occurs on all three major land masses: the Thai Malay Peninsula, Sumatra, and Borneo. I was fortunate enough to be able to gain access to samples collected in all of these places. And for Singapore, I did my own collecting. So I collaborated with the National Parks Board, and I conducted mist netting within the central catchment and Bukit Timah Nature Reserve. So the birds we caught, we sampled DNA from them using a very safe procedure where we take a pinprick of blood from the individual before we release it safely back to where we caught it from. Uh, we then bring the blood samples back to the lab where we extract the, uh, the DNA and then we, sum, uh, we selected four and sequenced four different mitochondrial loci. I then conducted some genetic analyses and then we compared it with overseas populations. So I had three main results from my study. The first result is that the populations from across Southeast Asia are deeply diverged genetically. So you can see the, in the genetic map, yeah, here, you can see that the Singapore individuals are quite similar to the ones from Sumatra and Peninsula Malaysia, but they're quite distinct from the ones in Sarawak and Sabah. Um, in this genetic map here, each circle represents a particular genotype. And the size of the circle shows how many individuals share that particular <coughs> genotype. The distance, the, the distance between genotypes is indicated by hash marks or numbers. So you can see once again that the Singapore individuals, they're quite similar to the ones in Malaysia, in Peninsula Malaysia and Sumatra. But they're a big distance away genetically from the ones in Sarawak and the ones in Sabah. In fact, these two entities are so distinct that we believe that they may not even be the same species as this, even though they are currently classified as one species. The second main result was that our local population seems to have very low genetic diversity. So I compared our local population with populations in Sabah and Sarawak, and I found that our intrapopulation genetic variability was about six times less. Now, some of you may say this is not a fair comparison because Sabah and Sarawak are so much bigger than Singapore. So in order to simulate a more fair comparison, I compared Singapore with Tawau Hills, which is in Sabah. It's about the same size as Singapore. And I had fewer samples from here, but even then, I could see that these samples had a much greater range of genetic variability than our Singapore samples. You can also see here the circles are bigger, which means there are more individuals sharing a particular genotype right here. The circles are small, showing that it's only one or two samples sharing a particular genotype, and the genotypes are very well spread out. Zooming in more on Singapore, this is possibly my most relevant result to the island. I found that within the central catchment, there was an uneven distribution of genotypes. So you can see my sampling localities here. And these circles correspond to sampling localities. The colors within the circle show how many genotypes I found at each locality. So you can see a difference between northern and southern central catchment. In the north, we have a lot more colors. And a lot of the colors here are not found here. What this means is that these two populations seem to be fragmented from each other. From a by a reservoir and golf course, and they do, not, they do not seem to have any gene flow. If there was a gene flow occurring, we would be seeing the same colors across an approximately equal number of colors in both places. As Prof. Frank mentioned, we recently lost a population of shark tail babblers right here in the Botanic Gardens. It seems that our southern central catchment population is also majorly threatened. And this has a lot of implications, not only for this species, but for other forest dependent species, which we may assume are doing well, because we find them spread out in the central catchment. But in actual fact, they're not having any gene flow between these subpopulations, and thus they may be genetically impoverished. Let me hand over to Prof. Frank. Okay, so, um, yeah, this is the division of the boundary between the northern and the southern patch here. 
Um, and also the southern patch has a, a lot fewer colors than the northern patch, which indicates that the southern patch probably has a lot poorer population genetic diversity and um, needs to be monitored heavily. Um, we're hoping that this shows that um, if Singapore is to avoid any future uh, further extinctions in terms of its, uh, at least in terms of its larger species uh, that are easier to go extinct, uh, like birds and mammals, um, there's an urgent need for habitat corridors that link up these uh, many different habitat fragments. This is a nice map of the central catchment that we got off of one of these discussion and position papers that really shows that the central catchment is not this homogenous block of habitat. It's got many tiny little patches of primary forest still in it, but then there's a lot of patches uh, between that uh, are not, not suitable for many of the species living in the central catchment. So there's a lot of fragmentation going on and there needs to be a lot of linking up of these fragments. Thank you very much.